Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, once said about this house, It's a great experience to see how the rich live. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. Today we are exploring White Marsh Hall, the third largest house to have ever been built in the United States. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of this house. Edward Stotesbury, more commonly known as Ned, was born in 1849. He had a natural gift for mathematics, which lent him an advantage in his early career as a financier and banker. Being able to predict market trends made him the perfect business partner for J.P. Morgan. The pair of investment bankers dominated Wall Street and became some of the wealthiest men in the world. Ned, having lost his first wife, needed someone to share his wealth with. He met Eva Bishop Roberts and quickly fell in love. The two went on to marry in 1912 and began planning their happily ever after. In 1916, the couple purchased 300 acres in Springfield, Pennsylvania to build their seasonal getaway. They hired architect Horace Trumbauer to design their dream home, which would cost $10 million, or, adjusting for inflation, the modern-day equivalent of nearly $300 million. White Marsh Hall would contain six stories, three underground, two above ground, and one concealed by the roof. The ceilings would be set beyond the human scale, with a room height of 25 feet on the main two levels. The house's footprint measured 283 feet wide by 100 feet deep. The 147-room mansion would be clad in Indiana limestone to compose the most exquisite example of the Palladian style to have ever graced the United States. The house was set atop a hill with perfectly manicured gardens extending from it. Twenty full-time groundskeepers were employed to ensure perfection. Entering the home, you would pass between the 50-foot-tall limestone columns composing the portico and arrive in the entrance hall with a grand staircase to the left side. Continuing forward, you would arrive in the 64-foot-long ballroom, which opened onto the back terrace overlooking more stately gardens. The ballroom could hold 800 guests and contained a pipe organ, which could be heard bellowing throughout the estate. Antiques decorated the rooms, most of which had been sourced by Joseph Duveen, who had helped Anna Dodge acquire her collection. Anna Dodge was close friends with Eva and would visit often for parties. Other notable guests included the future King of Sweden, King Gustav VI, and Marshal Joseph Joffre, the World War I hero of France. The guests were spoiled, with each receiving their own private suites with a private chauffeur to escort them about the property. The house cost over $1 million per year to maintain, or the modern-day equivalent of nearly $30 million. If that price seems high, it is because the house employed so many workers to run its facilities. White Marsh Hall had fully staffed rooms that rivaled the conveniences of any small town including an in-home movie theater, a barber shop, a bakery, a gymnasium, and a full-time tailor. The house even included a wine cellar despite prohibition. There were many other specialty rooms, all with full-time staff to make sure they were ready at a moment's notice for the occupants and their guests to arrive. We will continue looking at photos of White Marsh Hall while I recount the rest of the story. In 1929, the Great Depression would mark the beginning of the end. White Marsh Hall would no longer host large parties and events, but would instead close its gates. Ned and Eva set sail for Europe to wait out the recession, but returned after two years had passed, and they accepted that life in the United States would forever be different than what they had grown accustomed to. A few years later, Ned passed away in 1938, leaving Eva the modern-day equivalent of $83 million, not even enough money to maintain the estate for three years. Eva was quick to realize that even though she was still one of the wealthiest women in America, that she wouldn't have a penny left to her name if she didn't act quickly. She began selling the antiques, art, and furniture. But the markets were down, and the money she got for these items was not enough. She began parting with her jewelry collection, including her prized piece, a diamond pendant worth the modern-day equivalent of about $15 million, enough to maintain the house for half a year. She fired the vast majority of her staff to continue cutting back on cost, but the house was eating her alive financially. She cut her losses and donated the rest of the art and antiques to various museums and organizations before abandoning the estate altogether. In 1938, her close friend Anna Dodge reached out to her with compassion. Anna had a 13-acre estate in Washington, D.C., today's Belgian embassy which she leased to Eva for a price lower than a one-room flat. 
no longer worrying about becoming homeless, Eva now had a chance to sort out the rest of her affairs. She stopped paying for maintenance on the house and it began to weather throughout the changing seasons, holes forming in the roof, mold growing on the walls, and vines consuming the once perfectly manicured gardens. She no longer had any attachment to White Marsh Hall, but decided to make the best of it anyways. She donated the steel fence to be scrapped by the U.S. military, which provided enough metal to craft 18,000 firearms for use in World War II. In 1943, Eva finally found a buyer for White Marsh Hall. She sold the house and 45.6 acres to Pennsylvania Salt Company for $160,000, or the modern-day equivalent of $2.6 million. The rest of the property was sold to a developer who constructed 1,000 homes in the land which were mostly purchased by soldiers returning home from World War II. The Pennsylvania Salt Company outgrew White Marsh Hall's usefulness and sold it in 1964 to Willow Associates. But the new owner could never find a use for the mansion and it sat empty until it was auctioned off in 1970 for $700,000, or the modern day equivalent of $5.2 million. The new owners planned to demolish the mansion and build affordable apartments in its place. But the city would not issue building permits nor would they allow the lot to be rezoned for multifamily housing. The house was sold again in 1978 and was demolished in 1980. Today, townhomes now sit on the site of the once great mansion, with few reminders of what came before. Only the limestone columns which once graced the entrance stand tall atop the hill with remnants of the stone terrace and ruins below. It's hard to believe that such a grand structure once dominated the site, but I will leave you with this colorized photo to reflect on. I would like to thank Alex, a This House subscriber, for colorizing and submitting this photo to share with everyone. Thank you all for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Which part of White Marsh Hall stood out to you the most? Let me know in the comments below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I'd also like to take a moment to say thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to show your support and see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.